we would see and identify a need on a Sunday in a race. Hey, we're getting beat by this group of people doing these things. Mm Mm-hmm. For us to compete, we have to do it at least that good, if not better. Yeah. Well, that's on a, on a Sunday. The truck leaves on Thursday, and we go to race again Friday morning. The expectation was we'd have a solution from Sunday to Thursday. So you got to go fast. Got to go fast. And so to go fast, you have to you have to overlook the hierarchical procedures. You have yep. to overlook. Oh well, that idea can't come from Jim. He never went to college. Yeah. That idea can't come from this person. That can't be true. Doing it that way. No. 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 All ideas are good ideas until we prove that they're not, yeah. right? You've got to investigate all of them. And so that element of time, that time to market is probably probably the motorsport superpower. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash. And this is the Six Ranch Podcast. Four years ago, I bought a new truck for the first time ever, and I was so excited. It was incredible. It smelled good. It felt good. I wasn't constantly afraid of breaking down, you know? It was awesome. But after I drove it for a couple weeks... I do the same thing that I always do, and the back seat started just it started to fill up with stuff. You know, I'm guiding elk hunters and deer hunters, and I'm duck hunting and I'm fly fishing, and all that gear just accumulates. And pretty soon, I wasn't able to take people with me anymore, and I was embarrassed. You know, people would ask for a ride, and like, nah, sorry, man, I've I've got too much stuff with me. But I couldn't put it in the bed because then it gets damaged by weather. So I go to the internet. And I'm looking for options. And I ended up buying a deck to drawer system. Now, this was a, a big purchase for me, but it it's something that I felt like I needed and, and it looked like it was going to be a good product. And it really was. Deck came out with a new drawer system this year, and they've made some meaningful improvements over the previous one. You have almost no wasted space in your truck bed now. So you can access the sides of the drawers and then the drawers roll a full 18 inches farther out so you can actually access the back of the drawer even if you don't have a lot of arm reach there's some really strong tie down points on top that have a 400 pound load rating so if you're going to haul something like a motorcycle or big coolers or whatever you can really strap your gear down and make it secure you can lock these drawer systems so you can lock the drawers or if your tailgate locks, then uh, nobody can access the drawers anyways. So I actually feel like my stuff is more secure inside this drawer system than in the cab of my truck. That's a big deal to me. The complete deck system is made in America by Americans. And you know that that's something that, that I love and appreciate. They've got one that will fit in any truck or van that's been made in America in the last 20 years plus. You can go to decked.com slash six ranch and get free shipping. But just being honest with you, they get free shipping to everybody. I also, while you're there, want you to check out their deco line. So they've got a bunch of different boxes and storage containers that either fit on top of or inside of the drawer system and those are built really robust i saw the prototypes at an event this summer i'm impressed i'm excited to get my hands on them i haven't yet but the the prototypes were were super badass and the ones that uh that are in production model they're available now over at decked.com so even if you just need a place for some tools or you need a new bow case or you know, something along those lines, go check that out. And if you're driving around right now and your backseat is just full of gear and you can't haul people around, maybe you should consider uh, looking at the, the full deck drawer system because it's a good piece of gear. It was a good purchase for me and, and I hope it helps you. Alrighty, folks, I'm here in Eastern North Carolina, back in Pamlico County, a place that's near and dear to my heart with Mr. Tommy Wheeler. And my very first question for you, sir, is what does, what's needed to make a car go faster? You know, it's kind of no different than uh, any other business. You've got to find a space that you can manufacture an unfair advantage. Yeah. That's what it's about. That's business. That's racing. 
That's football, right? With your personnel that you got, you're trying to manufacture either through innovation or through hard work or um, operating in the margins, yeah. right? They say this, but they don't say that. Right. Right. You're trying to find that little room, those little fractional places where you can manufacture unfair advantages. And the person who manufactures the most unfair advantages typically wins. How much of it is car and how much of it is driver? You know, NASCAR in general is largely a series based on personalities and people. Okay. Different than Formula One. Formula One is largely technology driven. Yep. It's kind of a very European mindset. Whereas NASCAR really prides themselves on the people behind the scenes that are the innovators or the mechanics or the drivers that are actually what's making the cars faster. That's the the why behind the driver's name so big on the windshield or the pit crew member's name emboldened on the back shoulders like a football player would have. Because it is a big team. It takes a a lot of people to make that car go. That's right. How many people are going to be on a team? Well, you know, that's changed a lot over the years. You know, when I started in racing back in the kind of the mid to late 90s, you know, there were probably per car number in an organization, probably 30 people, right? And then that expanded through the 2000s and early 2010s that it would be 120, 130 per team, Mm -hmm. right? So if you had a four-car team, it was not uncommon to have a, five or 600 personnel wow. list wow. to manufacture, to, to engineer, manufacture, or engineer, design, manufacture, build, execute, right? That's kind of the path of racing. You know, you have this, this concept, this conceptual piece, and you actually have people that have to do, then you have people that have to then assemble all of that, and then you have people that take this off like the circus and uh, go town to town and actually race it and then provide the feedback back to the design team and the engineers and the team. So it's this huge to-do loop. And then, you know, with the advent of the new car, NASCAR in general really tried to get the people out of it. I don't agree with it. Mm. I, think that's a, I think that's a miss. I understand why they were doing it. You know, they were at, the, at its core was about money. Yeah. was trying to get the expense down for the car owners. Yeah. I always have a hard time feeling too sorry for anybody who has a plane. It's kind of a litmus test for me. Right. Right? Never feel bad for the guy with a plane. Never feel bad for a guy who owns a plane outright. Yeah. Because it's not that bad. Right. Right? So the people that own jets and planes were complaining about how much money they weren't making. Yeah. 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 I get that. What was your role on the team? You know, I started, when I started was kind of innocent enough, right? I I started in the mid to late nineties. And my role was a team engineer when frankly, NASCAR, we weren't really sure what team engineers, what that meant, what they even do with them. Is that the same, same thing as a chief engineer? Yeah. It's changed over time. Now it's a chief engineer. You you, you know, when you were an engineer team of one per team, you were the chief engineer. (laughs) So I I gained a lot of titles early, (laughs) you know? So the business card looked very impressive at a very young age. You know, I was the lead engineer the you know, the, the technical director of one, right? Yeah. So you didn't have very many engineers when you started out. But because we weren't really sure what engineers did, you know, engineers at the time also had to work. And so it was this learning in dog years. Yeah. It's this multiplicative mindset of, yeah, yeah okay, you're going to be this quote-unquote smart guy, which we're not really sure what the hell you're going to do. But we also, we can't take you on the road if you can't actually do something to help us. So we need to teach you how to be a mechanic. Right. And so you actually had a chance to work on things back in the day. And I think that's so important, especially for engineers. And I give engineers a hard time sure. a lot. Uh, and it's probably unfair of me, but I feel like they can take it because they're smarter than I am. But I think it's really important for engineers to go out and, and put their hands on the production side of things and, and on the mechanic side of things. For sure. I, you know, NASCAR, again, is a super, super unique demographic. How would, this, how would you describe the demographic? Well, the demographic is really Americana, yeah. right? And when I think about America to begin with, right, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're whatever, whatever mm-hmm. you are, for the most part, with enough honest-to-God hard work and enough go get it and give a damn and, and try, you can be pretty successful. I mean, it's not like we're born in a – 
We're not in a uh, communist block society where your path is determined based on what your family did. Right. Right. You have choice. Yeah. This element of choice. When well, NASCAR is very much the same way, you know, if you go to work at IBM or you go to work at uh, uh, Google, for example, mm-hmm. I feel certain that there's almost a caste system. It's sure. invisible, but yeah. it's there, right? Because it's like, okay, to be eligible for this role, you have to have this pedigree. You have to have this resume. You have to have this amount of experience. You have to have these criteria met, kind of like going through college. Right. In NASCAR, they really, we really don't give a damn. It's really about who's smart and who works hard and who's creative and who can contribute to making the car fast. If you, you know, you, Jim, happen to have a PhD, you could be sitting on the plane next to uh, Bob, who didn't even graduate high school. Mm-hmm. And you could be making $100,000 a year. And Bob is a crew chief. He may be making a half million dollars a year and never graduate high school. Right. That never get tolerated at Google. That never get tolerated at IBM because the caste system doesn't allow it. Yeah. And, you know, there's people who are shaking that up within the tech industry. And I think I think that's changing it a little bit. And I, I love seeing those changes as they occur because college has not been a good investment for a huge number of people. Absolutely. And, and we're really starting to see that. And I think a lot of the sound that we hear about – uh, about student loan repayment and student loan sure. forgiveness is because it turned out that that wasn't a good investment for a lot of people. Now, a lot of companies are starting to look at people who have skills and have innovations or the ability to innovate more so than they have a piece of paper that says an institution in their name on it. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, because I, I, as I went through the sport, you know, you start as an engineer and then you become the technical director again, which sounds better than it is. But then eventually you have a lot of engineers and you're leading this technical charge. And then ultimately I end up as the general manager where you're responsible for all of it. So right. I've, I don't know how many thousands of people I've interviewed, uh, but it's a lot. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that when we would interview kids, I called them kids, or people coming out of school or even new hires, you know, you were looking at three real fundamental principles of humble, hardworking, and smart. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're wanting to have somebody that's got an element of all three or the potential to have an element of all three. How did you suss that out in interviews? Uh, through conversation, yeah. right? You know, that's an interview. You, you put on your best fake face. That's what interviewing is about, right? Mm-hmm. Is that I'm trying to, if you're interviewing me for a job, I'm going to try to make sure I sell myself to you and tell you what I think the right choices are of the test yeah. that I'm taking. Yeah. Your job as the test giver is to force me out of my game. Right. And to really find or glean as much information in that conversation that you can to actually figure out who the person is. And I wouldn't care, you know, it's, for the most part, you weren't having a kid that said they were a mechanical engineer and, well, you, they went to Rutgers. So Rutgers is not a good engineering school. No no disrespect to Rutgers. I think it's a great place. But sure. using that as an example, you didn't have this evaluation based on accreditation, this false accreditation of the universities or school that determined good or bad. Mm-hmm. You know, you largely leave that to school and all these other people that says, okay, this person is largely – what kind of what we're looking for. Okay. Now our job is to figure out what can, what evidence can I find of hardworking behavior? You know, did he have to pay his way through school or did he get a scholarship? What did he get? What did he get a scholarship for? Was it kind of given to him because he was born with God given talents or did he have to work his ass off to get that? You know, what's an example of being humble? You know, does he work at the soup kitchen? Does he volunteer? Does he, can he tell you a story about how he failed? And how he recovered after that failure. Yes. Right? That's and where then that humility comes from. That's through, that right? humility piece. So you're looking for that, that piece. And then you're like, okay, now the evaluation of the smarts, to some extent, you're allowing other people to kind of vet that. But what you're really looking for, in, in my opinion, on, when you're looking at that, and it's the same here at Tidewater Grain, you know, we look for the same criteria. I'm looking for somebody who brings something to the table. Yep. A different look at life, a different life experience, a different thing because it'll show you some things that you never would have seen. If all of us graduate from Rutgers, back to my Rutgers example, if all of us went to Rutgers, well, we're all going to be pretty much indoctrinated into however they taught us the process should be. So we made it a real process, a real practice to not hire too many from one university. Mm-hmm. We were very good and blessed. That's smart. Because, because of it being a place that people wanted to work, that we'd have the opportunity to gain people. Say, well, you know what, we've got – a little few too many people from Virginia Tech. Yeah. Eh, 
you know, boy, if we got this kid that went to aeronautical school, well, let's go talk to him. Maybe he's got a little different look at life. Right. Or, or this other kid that went to a two-year college, right, really loved those guys. Mm-hmm. The two-year school kids that go on to get a four-year degree, that's your humility kid. Yeah. Right? Because it's not cool to do it that way. They didn't go to go their freshman and sophomore year and get to go party and do all that stuff. They had to – maybe they couldn't afford to go. Maybe they just had to work their ass off and do it a different way. You know, look at how long a kid's in school, right? Did it take them f- six years to get a four-year degree? Right. You know, those little subtle things for me are what I was looking for because, you know, you're inheriting that person and you're, you know, just like culture, right? Culture takes a lifetime to build, like a tree. Mm-hmm. It takes a lifetime to build a live oak and I can cut it down in seconds. Yep. Right? And so anytime you add uh, any new person to your team, you have the potential to augment and help your culture or hurt your culture. But what is certain is it will be different. Just like dropping a pebble in a five gallon bucket of water or in the ocean. You throw a rock into the ocean. You can't see the water level change, but it's higher. Right. It is different. Yep. And so you dump a whole bunch of rocks into the ocean and you've got a very different scenario than you had. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's really the same way that we used to look at personnel was really vitally important. You hire culture. You're hiring that mindset. And so if you want to have a team with a caste system and to have these jobs, you have to have this amount of pedigree and this amount of experience and this amount of education. You're going to get a very rigid cast oriented group that at times you could be passing over your best and brightest people yeah. just because they don't have these, these checklists. And you know, if you have that rigid system, you're probably going to have people who are really good at dipping back into the knowledge and accomplishments of people who've come before them. Correct. Whereas if you have that diverse group, you're going to have some innovators and people. Disruptors. Yep, you want disruptors. Who can come up with new ideas so that you can find that unfair advantage. That's exactly right. So of the advantages that you found to make cars faster, what are you most proud of? You know, that changes over time. Does right? it? It does. Yeah. Uh, for me, it has. Even, with, even with distance from the accomplishment? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it absolutely changes over time. Oh, you that's know, interesting. Early on, it was very uh, transactional, mm-hmm. right? I invented this. I came up with this idea. I made this decision. This result followed. Therefore, I'm smart. It was this real quick feedback loop. Okay. I made a choice to take two tires. Everybody else took four. We saw an opportunity that they didn't. We won the race. Hmm. That's pretty instant feedback. Yeah. Or a design choice of how we wanted to design a car or a little gray area in the rules that then NASCAR makes a rule for. So it was this cat and mouse game back and forth, right? So there was this pride on that very short term feedback loop. As I've gotten away from the sport and as probably you lose more hair and the hair you have turns more gray, it really becomes more process oriented about when you have people that used to work for you that are still calling you for references as a new opportunity they're taking on. Gotcha. Right, that you challenged them. I, I just had this experience, in fact, this past week where I had an individual, never went to college, just a hardworking guy, rose to be our production manager at the time under working for me with no quote unquote pedigree to us to establish that aside from he knew the sport, knew the people, knew how to get stuff done, and did an amazing job. Hmm. Right. So he leaves the sport for one reason or another and calls and says, Hey, do you mind you know, me putting you down as a reference, I'm going to go, it looks like I'm going to get this job being a production manager outside of the industry. Outside of the industry, you know, they're looking at it and say, well, what's your training? What's your, push your pedigree? Yep. Well, the pedigree at that point is largely experience-based. Yep. Right? So to have the opportunity to, to look back in that rearview mirror of the person that you gave an opportunity to, not with regard to uh, what college or what training or what other formal classical training you'd had, but because it was the human and it was the right person at the right time to lead that team of people is really humbling to have people still call you for that because you generated that opportunity through not establishing a certain hierarchical presence that had to be required to get that job to begin with. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. But if we were to get specific, like I, I yeah. understand that you were able to – change the shape of material through decibels. For sure. That is interesting to me. Yes, absolutely. You know, I I deal with 
with ballistics and, sure. and, and munitions a lot. And, uh, you know, the first like real ballistics problems that I was working on trying to solve were for, uh, tank main gun munitions and stuff that I actually ended up deploying with and using. Um, I never thought about how sound could change the shape of something. And I don't have a degree in physics. That's so, right. um, <clears throat> I don't think it, I don't think the physics thing, what physics in my background, cause that's what I've got a degree in is a degree in physics. Don't you have another degree too? in mathematics, but that just helps me do the, do the physics. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, that, what that really teaches you is to question everything. Yeah. Right. It's this humility thing It's to question everything, but not to question it from an arrogant point of view. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, I think I'm smarter than you, Jim. Let, let me explain to you how this works. No, it's like, well, why not? Yeah. What are the, what are the problems? Why can't this happen? Mm-hmm. And are there any solutions that we can come up with of how to address those reasons why we can't do this? Yeah. Right. So, you know, I'll give you an example back, back in the day in NASCAR, you know, it was very, you had a shape that the car had to be when it would go through technical inspection. Yeah. Templates and measurements and scanning even got to where they were scanning cars. But we, this is a cold, static this is car. a cold, static car. Yeah. Well, okay. How's this car really... What forces are going to be on it? Thermal, w- aerodynamic, torsional. Mm-hmm. What other forces are at play that we're potentially not even considering? And furthermore, what do we really want the car to be? Right. So we would ask that very frequently is, forget what is. If we could do anything, what would we want? Oh, I want this right front fender to be... Uh, skewed out by two inches and I want this area in front of the right rear tire to be pushed in but I want this lip right here and boy if I could really get the back windshield to suck down six inches that would be amazing Mm -hmm. so it started with these big questions of what do we want it to be let's answer that first then we can all work against that goal yeah how how do we get it there? how do we get it there just just you know oh okay I'm just gonna smash this brace I'm going to bend this brace. Okay, well, that's a solution until NASCAR catches you smashing that brace. Well, then, <laughs> okay, that's short-lived, right? Yeah. That creativity is very short-lived. And, and we used to say it all the time, facts are very short-term observations in NASCAR okay. of what works and how you do something. And, oh, this is fact. This is how you do it, Jim. Well, that's just until NASCAR or another team figures out this trick. Mm-hmm. And then you got to manipulate it again, and you're constantly changing. You know, the... I used the back windshield as an example, right? The rear the rear windshield of those cars back in generation before this, what's called the Gen 6 car, was crucial. Mm-hmm. The lower you could get the back windshield, the more rear downforce you made, the more rear downforce you made, the faster you went in the corner, the lower the lap time. It was cause and effect, performance on the racetrack, just that direct. Yep. You get it down, you're going to run faster. Yep. Okay, how we get the windshield down? NASCAR had all kinds of rules about templates and all of this stuff. Well, everybody was taking pictures. You'd take pictures of your competitors' cars. NASCAR's taking pictures. They could not figure out how our windshields were so low on the racetrack. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. They finally realized that we were using um, some unique materials, let's just call it, to hold the back windshield that at temperature became like putty soft. So think about the leg to your chair on uh, that you're sitting on. It has a certain amount of rigidity, a certain amount of compressive strength at this condition. Yep. That same chair, we put it in an oven to 250, 300, 350, 400. At some point, you fall down. Sure. Right? Yeah. It, but you, So it's okay. How do we create that scenario? So we found some of the thermal properties that we were looking for, and we would have these braces that as the car warmed up, as the car got really hot, the interior cockpit of the car, Guess what? The rear braces started to fail. Their dynamic load pressed it down. At the end of the race, when the car would cool, the chair comes back to life, right? And it took them forever to figure out what in the hell was going on. How is this even possible? We recognize what we see, which is a glass that is low. We've inspected it, and it's high. That it's where it should be yeah. before the race. Okay, so we're doing our job. We've inspected it after the race, and it's legal. What in the hell is happening in between, right? Yeah. And to NASCAR's credit, they started hiring smarter, more creative people 
that would then ask those questions that, that was the move and counter move. If we're yep. asking the question, well, how in the world would we do that? They were getting smart enough to say, okay, if we're okay here in time mm-hmm. and we're okay here in time, you know, after, before the race and we're good, after the race, we're good. We're not in the middle of the race. What are the possible reasons how that could even be true? And so it allowed them to start doing that. And so that cat and mouse game was always fun to try to create those spaces. Yeah. No, it, it, it's got to be the funnest thing because, like, you're, you're innovating something and you're getting away with it. Like, you're not breaking the rules except that you're thinking about a problem in a way that nobody else has ever thought about it before. Yeah, and I think the element of time, pardon the pun, right? Yeah. But the element of time is what made it unique. Yeah. That we would see and identify a need on a Sunday in a race. Hey, we're getting beat by this group of people doing these things. Mm -hmm. For us to compete, we have to do it at least that good, if not better. Yeah. Well, that's on a a Sunday. The truck leaves on Thursday, and we go to race again Friday morning. The expectation was we'd have a solution from Sunday to Thursday. So you got to go fast. Got to go fast. And so to go fast, you have to – you have to overlook the hierarchical procedures. You have yep. to overlook, oh, well, that idea can't come from Jim. He never went to college. Yeah, That idea can't come from this person. That can't be true doing it that way. No, no, no. All ideas are good ideas until we've proved that they're not. Yeah. Right? You've got to investigate all of them. And so that element of time, that time to market is probably, probably the motorsport superpower. Yeah. More than any other thing. It's, you know, really – Fantastic welders, fantastic fabricators, fantastic mechanics, engineers. Heck, the people that answer the phones mm-hmm. are first class, right? It's the best of the best of the best. you got to compete in all those areas. But what really made them stand apart was how they could operate at that very high elite level in a very, very short amount of time. Hmm. That is fascinating. It is. It's fascinating. You know, you, you brought something up earlier about questions. Yeah. And I think that asking the right question is is critical. And it's this skill that's not being taught and is only accidentally being learned by a handful of people. I was uh I was having a conversation with a with a gentleman the other day who's advocating for the removal of the uh the lower Snake River dams. Okay. And the same people that want to remove the dams are the same people who tend to be interested in a switch to electric vehicles. Mm, yep. And if I look at how much energy is going to be required by more yep. electric vehicles, we're going to need more electricity in the future and not less. And even though these, these dams aren't super efficient, blah, 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 whatever. It's uh, still not consistent with right. Statement one is not consistent with goal one. So, you know, I was asking the question of, how are we going to not only replace this electricity, but add to it? And um, he was trying to answer those, those questions. And I said, look, that's not what we need right now. We don't necessarily need answers to these questions. We need better questions. Mm -hmm. And that can seem like a waste of time and it can seem ineffective. But if you ask the right question earlier, that's better than answering the wrong question earlier you know we what i'm saying to, we used to constantly ask and, and again we still do here on the farm of what do we know what do we need to know and how do you know it like right. those are right. such fundamental fundamental questions, questions. Yeah. until you until you get comfortable with even asking those questions you can't really exact meaningful change yeah and you know so the whole the whole damn world I, you know the, the why right it all starts with why like simon Sinek says right i think mm-hmm. he's, he's right on that the why behind everything and why people don't so many times I think ask those questions is fear of failure. Yep. Right. It's this feedback loop. This, this try fail do again loop has somehow a long time become not good. Yep. Oh, if you're failing, if you're trying and failing, that means you're no good. That means I'm going to, and maybe it's social media. I don't know. Maybe it's the, maybe it's Mm. the feedback loop on, on thumbs up or thumbs down is so quick now. Yeah that people don't have a chance to embrace that failure and think about why they failed and think about what they need to do to improve moving forward. Maybe the, you know, if this happens so fast that somebody just tells you you suck and that's just too tough for you to handle. So, you, <laughs> so you're like, okay, he's right. I suck. I, I better do something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? But 
that's what we got to get really. And I know this is more philosophical, but I really think that's the, the fundamental problem is we got to get more comfortable failing. Yeah. Right. And, and, and have the confidence back to that humility, right. That when we try something and it doesn't work and it's un, unimpeachable that this is not the way forward to not double down and say, Oh no, no, no. I've said it's going to work and therefore it must. And we continue to invest and do that. No, there's no shame in changing. There's no shame in saying, oh, shit, that's not a great idea. Let's try to do it this other way and, and we see li- what happens. We live during such a good time that the reality of failure isn't that bad. Oh, I mean, like, right. I mean, you, you don't you, have. We're not hunting saber tooth tigers with a spear. Absolutely. Like, if you fail at that. That's yeah, bad. There's, there's the a consequence. There's a big consequence. Yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah. But if you fail at something, most things in, in modern society, it's going to be okay. There's lots of do-overs. Yeah. There's lots you of get chance to, try to, again. To, to live, <laughs> and I'm going to give this a shot yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. You know, that's why people miss deer, right? Is they get torn apart by two forces. One of them is the fear of failure, and the other is the desire for gain. And whenever you combine those two things, you get lost in the middle of the tug-of-war, and that's why people miss. That's what target panic is. And I think that people experience that in all kinds of pressure situations. And that pressure is invented. It's imagined. And if you have the fear of failure on one side and the desire for gain on the other, and you don't focus on the process, which is what's in the middle, then you'll get torn apart. It's so funny to hear you say it that yep. way. It's, it's, it's so true. I get that. I go through it, you know, I'm a duck hunter, you know, the pintails come in and I always shoot, ba- <laughs> I shoot terrible. I, I am, I am, my, my success rate is very low against the noble pintail. And, uh, but, but, you know, God, God bless the wood duck or the teal. I mean, it's, it's like, I hate them. It must, that's the only logical explanation. I just, yeah, they're shoot harder them, to hit and they are. And I just shoot yeah. them with just, just hating my heart for them. Right. <laughs> but, you know, in the motorsport side, you know, what we would actively recruit for, like CIA style, like mm-hmm. profiling people, the best people. And if I'm honest, I put myself in the same category. We look and would strive to find people that were terrified of failure. Yep. But with no regard for gain. Yep. That's the sweet spot because that person. We're on the same page. That person is just going to stay up at night and think about how to improve that process. Yep. And, oh, I didn't do it well. well damn, you, you won the race. Well, but we only won by half a second. Yeah. And if we'd have done better at this, this, and this, we would have won by three seconds. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I wrote a big article series this year on shooting, hmm. and uh, I called it Never Miss Again. And what I realized before I started writing this is that it's not so much that I love to hit the target. It's that I hate missing. Hate missing and lo- suffering the eternal shame. Yeah. For me, and I've said this on the show many times, but uh, accomplishment is a very hollow feeling for me. It's like, very short-lived, isn't it? If I achieve something, it's like, ugh, that wasn't that great. You know, it, it just doesn't last very long. And it, it honestly makes me feel like I didn't set my goal high enough if I actually achieve something. But I am absolutely, I, I hate missing. I hate losing. I can't tell you the beard length of the biggest turkey I've ever killed, <laughs> but boy, I can tell you with great detail everyone I've missed. That's right. I That's mean, right. With, I can tell you the where the sun was and the barometer and yep. what it felt like and smelled like. Yep. and Yeah. It's so true, though. Yeah. No, we're on the same page there. Okay. Uh, shifting gears here a little bit. We're sitting in the mill for Tidewater Grain. Yes. Uh, I've been here once before. Uh, I got to come and see this two years ago. It's changed so much in that time. Um, when I was here a couple years ago, I was able to, you know, reach down into the the bin at the end of this milling yep. process and pull out some grain. And I took home a couple of pounds of it. Uh, it's the best rice I've ever had in my well, life. Well, thank you very much for saying um, that. And checks I, in the mail. I, <laughs> no, I, I I mean that sincerely. Well, thank you. I think you've done a, a really interesting thing here. And and rice is such an important food for the world. It is. It really is. This rice has an interesting story. Um, this this mill is doing an interesting thing. And then the way that wildlife are interacting mm. with your agriculture is very very consistent with what I think agriculture should be everywhere. That's right. 
And I would love for you to tell me about the history of, of this rice. Sure. And, and then we'll get into the rest of it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. So, you know, fundamentally, we grow uh, ancient grain, heirloom rice, uh, most notably Carolina gold rice or, and Santee gold long grain. Okay. So two variations, right? In the grand scheme of things, there's only two types of product there. And then we also do a lot of what's called violetta barley for the beer industry. And we grow a, a product called seashore black rye that is used for distilling and even just some high end cotton, right? Mm-hmm. For people like that. So really this farm is about, we try to, we try to clothe you, get you drunk or feed you. Great. Right. It's a great combination yeah. without that. I mean, if we did shingles, we'd have it all covered, <laughs> you know, we could, if we could, if we could house you somehow, yeah. you know, and I guess maybe we can because we sell a bunch of trees. So we can, we can figure it out. Right. So maybe There's we do. Way. Maybe so. Yeah. But, uh, you know, really for us, it's about uh, growing that ancient heirloom grains that are too difficult for other people to grow, mm-hmm. right? Think about back to our conversation where it started. It's about manufacturing that unfair advantage. Now, what makes them ancient heirloom? Because yep. these are buzzwords that get thrown oh, around. Sure. That's a great and, point. And, uh, you know, you yep. might go through the grocery store and be like, here's an heirloom tomato. Yeah. It's like, what does this mean? What does that yep. mean? Heirloom fundamentally means it's really, really old. Okay. okay? As a rule of thumb, at least 100 years old. Okay. okay? And with rice, there's only one heirloom rice in the Americas. Okay. Okay. And that is Carolina gold rice. And, and rice, that's is the original not, rice is not native to it's not, America. N- in fact, all rice goes, the origin story for rice goes back to a single boat that came from Madagascar in 1685. Wow. One boat. Yeah. You think of, you think of these singular moments in time and the profound impact it could have on the future. I love that. Okay. Yeah. So think about this one boat, this one boat comes and runs aground outside of the Charleston Harbor. A dentist by the name of Dr. Henry Woodward said, wow, they need to get their boat fixed. What do they have on the boat? Because I imagine at the time in the colonial times, boats meant opportunity. Sure. Who knows what could be on this boat? Yeah. Right. Gold or salt or sugar or who the heck knows what could be on there. Well, lo and behold, it had some rice mm-hmm. that had come from Madagascar. So they effectively horse trade. They fix the boat. They get these casks of rice that come into the Americas, and the rice kingdom was born. They planted it in the low country of South Carolina. It expanded as far north as the Tidewater region of Virginia, basically mm-hmm. Richmond, as far south as Augusta, Georgia, as far west as I-95 corridor for any of you East Coasters listening. You know, it's that I-95 corridor. That whole region became known as the rice kingdom. Okay. Okay. Rice flourished, did well. Same boat leaves Charleston Harbor, goes to the Caribbean. Guess what happens there? Origin story for rice in the Caribbean. Then goes from the Caribbean, goes to South America. Guess what? Origin story for rice in South America. Imagine no beans and rice at your Mexican restaurant. Sure. There was no rice until 1685. Wow. All of it came from one boat. All of it came from the same origin story of this one boat that just happened to infect COVID style, infected Sure. Two continents, right? With this wonderful grain. All that rice here became magic at the time because it was rice is largely considered a crop of last resort, right? Mm-hmm. You grow it when you can't grow anything else. You know, in and, and your part of the world it would be uh tumbleweed and maybe some cotton. Yeah. Right? You yeah. know, you grow it when you're really struggling on other stuff. Yep. Too arid soil or what have you. So it the rice really likes this mucky low tufted grain soil profile, which we've got a lot of in the coastal plain area of the eastern seaboard of the U.S. And so it became huge all the way up until around 1900, 1900, 1910. Well, the whole world was changing and around that time. You had emancipation of the slaves. And obviously it was a industry largely run and fueled by slave labor. Mm-hmm. But more importantly than even that labor component was the intelligence that the the slaves and the people working the fields were actually the only people that knew what the hell they were doing. Sure. You know, the the plantation owner, yeah, maybe the owner of record, but didn't really know how to do it. You know, they were actively indenturing servants from Sierra Leone and Western Africa, people that had this rice background hmm. and uh, and having them come over here and grow this stuff. So when that, that they emancipation of slaves occurred and, and they were declared free, you know, they lost the ability to really grow those crops. You also had the rise of the machines, I call it, you know, 
before AI, there was this thing called the Industrial Revolution that everybody was scared, I've heard of it. scared to death yeah, of, I, right? I, I remember there was a yeah. chapter in the book so, about uh, that. You know, as, as much as we need to be cognizant and aware of AI, I do think that there will be a, a future for us, yeah. for us people that are walking around. Um, no different than when the tractor was born. I'm sure that everybody thought that was the end of the world, too. I think the AI is the tractor. I, it is. I it's talk just about a, that all the time. It's just a different... It's a different yeah. thing. It's evolution of the mind and yeah. of the technology. And you had all of that occurring at the same time. Well, lo and behold, you could drain the soil now. You you could dig a ditch. Before, you had to do it with a shovel. Right. Right? Oh, damn. Let's dig us a ditch with this backhoe. Yeah. This tractor, you know? So yeah. now the labor component, right, was less significant because now we could do it with mechanization and automation. We could now drain these soils and now even potentially grow higher uh, dollars per acre crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, mm -hmm. right? Really started really helping them out in that regard. And so you had this big Western migration of the population in the U.S. too, notably all the freed slaves getting away from the situation they were in in the South, right? Yeah. When you're freed, I, I can't imagine you say, oh, well, I'm going to go down the street a mile from here and I'm going to set up shop. You're going to probably get away from here. Mm -hmm. And that's what you had. You had a lot of that intelligence mass moved to the center of the U.S., and guess what? That's where your rice ground is now. You know, your Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Louisiana, and even all the way into northern California became where they started growing rice. You know, but the, the fundamental thing is, okay, well, what? All right, Tommy, that's all interesting. That's a history lesson, but why is, back to the heirloom question, what makes this unique? Well, what was happening was along the line, once you make the leap of faith of I'm going to come up with a tractor, so that I can be more efficient. More efficient is just a, a, a synonym for make more money, right? Yeah. That's all yeah, it is. Yeah, put less right? into it and get more out of it. That's right. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm trying to make more money. Well, okay. Well, then somebody says, well, look, uh, you know, Jim, your rice last year grew better than my rice. Why don't we plant your rice this year? Oh, sure. that sounds like a good plan. Yep. Your higher yield. So you had this natural self-hybridization that was occurring through proximity mm -hmm. and visibility. Yep. Right? You had a better crop than I did, we're going to grow it. I had a better crop than you did, we're going to grow mine. And this went on naturally for hundreds of years. Well, then you had the advent of basically agronomics and science started getting involved where they, we started monkeying with the fundamental principles of it, right? Now you're talking about genetically modified. Now we're talking about genetically modifying crops. Yep. And at the end of the day, the reason why we genetically modify crops is to make more money. Yep. Right? Put, put less in, get more out. Fundamental. Yeah. Real simple. Okay. But, but the more coming out, oftentimes when we're talking about that with crops, might mean a different taste, might mean less nutrition. It's not even considered. Yeah. It's not important. And that in that in that arena, it's not important. Because they're thinking about tonnage. It's tonnage. It's yep. bushels per acre. Yeah. Pounds per acre. Tonnage per farm. That's the whole thing that drives it. And that's the magic. That's the unfair advantage that the Carolina gold rice represents is that it rewinds the clock all the way to that noble boat that came in in 1685, hmm. that the genome and the genetic properties are identical to that grain of crop. The USDA has certified so that. So amazing. It is. So and, amazing. And, you know, people ask me, say, well, Tommy, you know, help me understand why that matters. Why does that even matter? Well, I, my example I use is if I asked you for your driver's license right now, and there's a printer behind you, which are, are people can't see, but I take your driver's license, I make a photocopy of your driver's license, and then I make a photocopy of that photocopy, and I do that about 20, 50, 100, 200 times. I may still be able to see that it's a picture of you and recognize what it is loosely, but I'm probably not going to be able to tell your birth date, and I'm probably not going to be able to read your address, and I'm not going to do it. You lose that fidelity over time through copying and the fidelity of that copy. Yep. Right? Well, that's what happens with watering all this down through this hybridization for all these other reasons that are logically, logically driven them. I need the plant to be shorter. I need the plant to be higher yielding. I need it more resistant to lodging, which means blowing over. I need this property or that property. I'm not really paying attention to can I read the driver's license. Mm -hmm. I'm just wanting to modify this. Yep. And you end up with something that's so different. And so like our rice... I tell people all the time, I'm like, you know, our rice, it's like a different food group. It's almost not even the same thing. It's not the same thing. It is. It, it's really not. And, and, and that's where I would go with it is like, if somebody says, well, 
why does this matter and what's the difference? Take a bite of it. That's it. That's simple. I'm, I'm you know, it's really easy. Yeah. Just, I'm like, not this, telling you This anything. is a different experience. And then not only do you take a bite of it and be like, wow, this tastes different. Check in on yourself on how you feel after you eat it. Well, the, the magic, and, and we've had, you know, our biggest customer, this is something I'm probably most proud of, our biggest customer in the state of North Carolina is who? If you had to guess, who's our biggest customer in the state of North Carolina? Gosh, I'd, I'd have no guess. It's a distributor or a fancy restaurant, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah. No, it's the public schools. Oh, really? Think about it, right? That's Think the, about your comment, right? That's oh, great. Oh, really? That's weird. I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah. The most cost-conscious group out there. Hmm. And the why is because of us rewinding the story that now, guess what? This rice has flavor. Yeah. This rice tastes like something. Well, guess what? If you have that flavor, guess what you're not having to do? You're not having to add salt. You're not having to add pepper. You're not having to add butter. You're not having to do those things. Right. And so when you look at the holistic behavior, as we talk about environment and all the things that no different than the, uh, the electric vehicle people, out in your world trying to take the dams away from the Snake River, they're looking at the world through a coffee straw. Mm -hmm. The view gets very narrow. Instead of looking at the totality of the whole experience, how do we do the best job for the whole thing with us, with our Carolina Gold Rice and, and even our long grain version that we have, you're not having to add those things. So therefore, yes, a little more expensive. It's a lot better for you. It tastes like something, and they're not having to make it bad for you. Yeah. The reason that it surprised me the most that the public schools are your biggest customer is that I got fed slop. In yeah, public it's schools, different you now. Know? It's a, and you know. that That's great. That, that's really is. heartwarming. Um, now, the answer that I was about to give you is that I think your biggest customer might be waterfowl. Oh, for sure. Yeah. They're big, they're big consumers. Yeah, so something that you and I – have in common is that we both love duck hunting. Absolutely. And, and I truly do. I love duck hunting. I love hunting with my dog. I like taking people duck hunting. Mm -hmm. I like seeing ducks. I like trying to sound like a duck. I love everything about duck hunting, except that I got to wake up pretty darn early in the morning yep. and sometimes the weather sucks, but I do it anyways because I love it so much. Now there is a very inter interesting relationship between rice and waterfowl. For sure. And part of that is that water is part of rice production. That's right. Um, so I'm guessing, and I haven't been here in the spring, but I'm guessing that the waterfowl get to nest in these areas because of the rice production. They, some do. We gain some production with our, uh, some black ducks are here year round. Yep. Um, we have some wood, a lot of wood ducks that are here year round. Um, but most of our ducks book it out of town. Okay. They're Yankees. They're going most farther of, north. Yeah, most of our most of our ducks are Yankees at, at, at the core. They're carpet baggers, as we would call them in the <laughs> south, right? <laughs> Bluebirders. Yeah. The original the original bluebirders, right? Yeah. Instead of from coming from Michigan to Florida, ours are moving from North Carolina back to the Arctic area. You know, but what we re, what we really focus on is fueling them up before their their big road trip. Yeah. We make sure that we hold water all the way just as long as we can. This is always a fight. Our biggest fight on the farm every year is when can we get this water off of here yep. so that we can dry everything down so that we can plant it again for next year. Yep. That is always the squeeze for us. We we hold it just, we're looking at the weather, and we hold the water as long as we can because the longer we hold the water, the longer we hold the waterfowl, the more waterfowl we have, the more fueled up they are for the trip. And we frankly believe that the better we do with that, the more birds we have in the sky next year. It's the truth. Uh, you know, yeah. it's no different than when we go on, you go on vacation. You you probably have a uh, a truck stop that you like stopping at that they have trained you that they have the best brisket sandwich in. Maybe it's Bucky's, yeah, or whatever, right? You, I stop at exit one hundred and nine every time I make this road trip. Well, mm -hmm. you know, your experience has trained you that that's where you stop to fuel up. Yep. Okay, we're trying to create that same experience for these ducks that when they're coming down south, boy, I really want them stopping here in Hortonsville to see us, pay us a visit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Unfortunately for them, a few of them don't leave. They got to pay the tax. So somebody's got to pay. Yeah. 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 Not everybody gets free lunch. Not everybody gets free lunch. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing that I think is cool about this type of agriculture, and it's the it's the terrain and, and geology and geography that lend itself to this, but it's not a monoculture. It's, it's mm. a highly variegated habitat. For sure. So you're going to have marsh. You've got a, a saltwater huge saltwater element. element 
you've got um, brackish water estuaries, you've got timber, and all of that is right next to each other. And whenever you have lots of different species and lots of different habitat types right next to each other, then you're going to have diversity in your wildlife. Absolutely. And, and that is occurring here in abundance. We, we like what we like in this area, and it's a macro thing in, in Pamlico County. There's no reason why wildlife needs to go anywhere else, hmm. right? There's not a city to run them off. There's not a lack of food. There's not froze up where we don't have water. Like you said, you know, if you want to be, if you're a duck and you want to have high calorie food, well, we've got a solution for that. Yeah. If you're a fish and you need to have babies so that more can come back next year, we've got a solution for that. We've got the largest estuary in the East Coast is right here in the Pamlico Sound. Well, I was just looking at... We've got it all. I was just looking at one of these fields that's being flooded right now. Yeah. And in the dike next to it, it was wonderful for me to look at because I could see the soil column. Mm -hmm. So I could see this, uh, what I'm guessing is like a, a silty loam on That's top. Right. And then there's an interesting little like blue sandy layer, and then it gets into a clay layer. That's right. And, uh, that was fascinating. But within that dike that was being flooded, it was full of fish. That's right. And that's the, the fish thing blows our mind every year. I, and that's, you know, that's the, uh, I don't know. Maybe if you're a, a Yankee, it's the Aurora Borealis or whatever. That every year it's just a miracle to see. For us, you know, all of our fields are and all of our ditches are effectively dry yeah. around Memorial Day. Right. And then by the time we harvest rice and by the time the fall comes in, friends, uh, a good friend of mine, Gene Wooster, myself, who's been on your show, we will go and, and throw cast nets in our ditches, and that's where we make our bait for drum fishing. Right. In four months. Sure. From nothing, from it being dry to four months later having what we call cob mullet, you know, 12 inch long striped mullet to be there. And every year we ask these questions like, where, how does this even happen? Like, yeah. how, how does, how does, how does the good Lord even make this a possibility? And, you know, really for on that side, it really comes down to birds and back to that system, right? If you don't have the moist soil for when we're growing rice, if you don't have the freshwater snails, if you don't have the freshwater shrimp and the, the invertebrate production and all of these crawfish and natural things that are happening in this marsh habitat to grow this rice that we need to do, then you don't have the birds. And if you don't have the birds, then the birds don't have the eggs that are stuck to their legs or that they are have ate the fish in the, down the road and then poop it out in our place that then becomes perfect for them to have fish. This whole system really works together and you take one piece of it out to that monoculture that you speak of you take one piece of that out of the equation and the whole thing fails yep, yep. you know most people we do a lot of we grow a lot of corn for ducks and everybody mm. you know oh you know how much corn do you find in the ducks uh, it's really rare yeah and i was like what do you mean i mean you look at all this corn that must be the crawl must be full of it we typically don't see a single kernel of corn in a duck until about christmas right but we start shooting ducks in September when the teal come down. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, what are they? They're not just there hanging out. What's what's going on? Well, guess what? They're they're harvesting the invertebrates. They're doing all the snails, all the stuff we talked about. No different than you and I. At least I've never talked to a duck, but I imagine that what they're thinking is when it's ninety degrees outside, I don't feel like eating a lasagna. Yeah. Right. So they're probably eating a little lighter food, a little smaller seed production all that natural stuff that we allow to grow in our ditch banks and our, in our fields um, are really what feed these ducks. I mean, if you run the math, we don't have enough food to feed them. Right. We just, we just, there's not enough BTUs for the amount of ducks. If you work out how many BTUs per duck and you get a biologist to come in and count how many ducks you got and you kind of start doing this math, we've only got, you know, a month and a half of food. So how do we make it work for seven months? Well, it's because they're not surviving on a single item of a kernel of corn. They're eating a lot of they're stuff. Not e they're not eating yeah. just a grain of rice. Yeah. It's all of it that takes it all to work together. Now, it's something that I probably shouldn't even talk about because I'm not that well versed on it, but I know a lot of, uh, a lot of mallards in particular are hybridizing with domestic ducks mm. and it's changing the geometries of their bills mm. and making it so that they're less effective at, at uh, accessing different food types. That's something that I think is, is threatening ducks, especially on the East Coast and, yeah, and moving think, west I think the bit. way that we combat all of it, we, we try to think of our place as a uh, mall, mm -hmm. right? 
the reason why malls are so popular is it's got for the most part everything you need. Right. If you want to, if you're hungry, you got a place to eat. Yep. I guess the only thing you're lacking is sleep. Maybe you can do it at a mattress store, right? <laughs> you want to eat, you want to walk around, you want to shop, you want to go to the music store, want to catch a movie. You kind of got the whole family taken care of. Well, that's our mindset that we put towards all of it. You know, if we have ducks that come down right to that truck stop, right at Bucky's, our, mm-hmm. our, our truck stop, is, and they want to loaf and they want to swim around, well, we need to have a spot for that. If we want to, if they don't want anything, don't want to be around anybody, I'm just having, I need to have a me, a me day. I want to be away from all other ducks. we got to have enough room for that. But if you want to be communal, if you want to have corn, if it's cold, you want this. We try to have all that diverse habitat so there's absolutely no reason for them to leave to include water depth. Yeah. Right? Critical. Back to that build difference that you're talking about. Yep. Right? For the most part, we think of widgeon are like the – widgeon are the scavengers of the ducks. That's the way we treat them. I love widgeon. Oh, they're beautiful. They find me wherever I go. They're, they're amazing. That's my favorite <laughs> duck. And is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and I think the reason why is because they are very opportunistic. Mm-hmm. They are not ashamed. They have no ego. If there's coots over here, <laughs> right, the black sheep of the of the duck universe, not they don't even get to call themselves a duck, right? I mean, yeah, think of how they think, get their own think of the shunning, think of the shunning in the duck universe. You don't even get to get called a duck. <laughs> and it's like, well, wait a minute. We live beside each other in the Arctic, and we all fly down, and I sit on the water, and I eat stuff just like you. Yep. Why am I not a duck? Oh, you're out of the club. Yeah, Sorry. Your, your feet look funny. Your feet look funny. <laughs> Sorry, you're no, you're not cool like us. So they will go and land right with those coots because coots are notorious messy eaters, hmm. right? And these widgeon, very short bills, shortest bill next to maybe the ruddy duck, right? Right, of all the ducks that you've got in there. And so they're going to go hang out with the messy eater crowd so they get make it easier on them to clean up efficient. behind them. Very efficient. Yep. I like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, after this, we're going to be having a little low country boil, and you're talking about taking care of family. You're taking care of a bunch of people here today. We've got Absolutely. a little retirement party. I've imitated what I think are low country boils at home, but I guarantee you I've done it very wrong. I'm so excited for this. Tell me what a low country boil is and what this one is. So a low country boil is uh, that frogmore stew there's all kinds of goofy names depending on where you're at in the country they're gonna call it something different frogmore stew. frogmore stew and i had heard that i found that in south carolina i was like what in the what is this frogmore stew I've, I've had a lot of stews in my day and they're like oh well you know you add some it's a boiling pot of water and we're gonna put some corn in it and some potatoes in it and some sausage and some shrimp and i was like you mean a low country bull they're like well yeah Frog yeah, more stew. That sounds like a frogless stew. Yeah, that's exactly right. No so I don't know. But I'm assuming the community of Frogmore somehow convinced everybody <laughs> that they somehow came up with this somehow or I something. I love it. Yeah, you know, at, at, you know, you got to remember even shrimp. Think about that, right? That the Low Country Bowl is a very communal event. Yep. Okay. And it's basically grounded in poor people. Mm-hmm. Remember that, right? That shrimp wasn't even eaten by people that had any status until after the Great Depression. Yeah, some of our most celebrated foods today are poverty foods. You look at lobster, brisket, shrimp. Uh, um, Bacon and eggs was was started post-Great Depression. Yeah. Right? The list goes on. Yeah. Right? Same with this. Okay, if you've got leftover shrimp, you've got leftover corn, you've got potatoes, you've got, what do I have in the cupboard? Well, hell, let's just boil all this and let's just dump it out on the table. We don't need plates. We don't need pots. It's a single pot meal. And it's great at bringing community together. Yep. Nothing binds people together like food and struggle. Mm. Right? Yeah. You know, when you have commonality and struggle, that's what pulls people together, i.e. a hurricane. Yeah. That's the best of times. Mm. The irony. Yeah. In a community, as hard as it is as a community down here in the low country, post-hurricanes are when you see humanity. Mm. Humanity exists in the weeks following hurricanes, you know, because that, everybody struggles. That was my first time ever being up here in this country. Mm-hmm. I was stationed in stationed in uh, Camp Lejeune, and a hurricane came through. I think in 2010 or 2011. Yep. And because I'd grown up with a chainsaw and had a bunch of experience with uh, with logging and and cutting trees fighting fire i saw all these trees down so i grabbed my saw and i just drove up the coast and started helping people that needed trees cut and that's what initially brought me over minnesota to this country and started meeting people and uh, 
it was incredible. And I did that for every weekend for several weeks afterwards. Yeah. And I loved how this community came together to help each other out after that it, hurricane. There's, there's no lawyer, the person who bags your groceries. There, Everybody has trees. Sure. Everybody has struggle. Yep. Right? Yep. And everybody works together during that time. It's amazing. So the Low Country Bowl is a great example of that communal low country or just communal spirit. You can do a kick-ass low country bowl in Arkansas or in Idaho, yeah. right? You just got to get the ingredients. And really, it starts off with a big pot of boiling water. And you add some amount of seasoning to taste, right? Be very weary of a low country bowl in Louisiana. <laughs> that is your tech tip for today. <laughs> so, that's, a, that's a wet fire. <laughs> yes. I don't know what they call it, but it is not low country bowl. Okay. It is not frogmore stew. I, I don't know what. Oh, I'm telling you, you will, you will find the insides of, you will see some of the stuff that you haven't seen in your body for years. It, uh, it's it's a cleanse. It's the original colon cleanse. Okay, all right. And uh, but anyway, you start off with a big pot of boiling water, and then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add potatoes. Okay, right. They're the stubbornest item we're going to cook. It takes about twenty minutes to cook, boil a potato. So you're looking for what we would call number two reds. So can you know just nuanced? You want yeah. these perfect, you know, baseball size potatoes. If you get too big, you got to cut them down. You're just trying to get to a target size, okay. like a tennis ball size or a racquetball is about ideal, just so your timing works. Sure. Right? And um, so you'd put you some potatoes in, then you're going to boil it for a while, and you're going to look like you know what you're doing, and you're going to stir it around, and you're going to lament, <laughs> and you're going to maybe have a fork, and all oh, that's for show. Yeah. Right? It's just time. Uh-huh. It's just, just BTUs and time. Yep. Right? And after about 10 or 12 minutes, we're going to put some sausage in, you know, whether you're in kielbasa or beef links, or if you like, whatever you're into, right? Mm -hmm. You're going some one inch chunks of that. Again, you're just trying to get it to where it all has about the right temp. So you can cut that up and you throw that in and you're going to stir it around again. And I don't even think stirring is necessary, but we're going to do it anyway, all because right. it'll make, it's kind of like decoys. Yeah. You're not duck hunting if you don't have decoys, That's right? That's the truth. So you got, these are the decoy equivalent, right? Yeah. So we're going to stir it around and lament over the whole thing. And then we're going to add some corn, maybe even some onions along the line, mm -hmm. uh, just again for flavoring. And then at the very end, the, 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 the featured attraction occurs, which is the shrimp. Mm -hmm. And you can, do, you can do a low country bowl with crab legs. You can do it with, you know, if you're into crawfish or kind of any other quick kind of protein shellfish type thing. You just put it in and you're just blending it all together. And then we're going to basically drain it very quickly. You don't want to overcook your shrimp is always a challenge. And then we're going to basically dump you either. There's two schools of thought. You either dump it out on the table. Mm-hmm. It's it's visually striking. Yep. But a horrific mess. Can't imagine. Right? Yep. Or you're gonna put it in pans or some sort of an item that then allows people to come, you know, pick what they want. Yep. Right. It's kind of a choose your own adventure. If you're if you're really into shellfish, you're gonna you know, the old timers, boy, they were each out of house and home on the shrimp. They're going right for them and Okay, you know, so is it a party foul if I go in there and high grade and go straight to the oh, shrimp? Oh, no. That, okay. In fact, it's encouraged. It's encouraged. Yeah, it's All encouraged. Right. Yeah. It's a... Because uh, I feel like the potatoes are a decoy oh, in this is. whole situation. Oh, it is. Like, it's, that's it's, a trap. That is. It, and it's trying to eat you up. <laughs> it's the it's the hush puppies or the free bread at the steakhouse. Oh, I love hush puppies. I know. So that's right. They, yeah. they, they, they've already profiled they, you. They got me. They got you. Yeah. That's exactly right. We can't get hush puppies at home. We don't even know what they are. Oh, man. That's disappointing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way it works. And so it's a big communal event. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we're doing, uh, you know, again, in the agricultural or any community, you know, you got, uh, we got asked by a lady or a group called the Farm Service Agency here, which is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yep, FSA. That's right, the FSA yep. office. And a lady that has been unbelievably impactful for all of agriculture in Pamlico County for decades. Yep. Um, you know, Cheryl Krause, that we had the opportunity to host them today. So we're going to have 70 or 80 people here and hopefully roast Cheryl some. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we do. But if nothing else, I can guarantee we're going to eat good and we're going to have some oysters that are all from right here and all the shrimps from right here. So when we were fishing the other day, oh, okay, got to see that oyster farm. Lighthouse Shoal Oyster Company and right I was, there. I was asking Gene about it. And Alex was actually over there washing oh, all yeah. the oysters out. So we got to go over go to see the process to the rig. And he had just put in 150,000 oyster seeds, which yep. are baby, baby oysters. Right. They're like, uh, 
I don't know, an eighth of an inch, the cutest yep. little things. And in about a year, they'll be two and a half to three inches long. But he was pulling these oysters out in these racks that had, you know, 50 trays of oysters in them. And it's like a high rise. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a sky rise underwater. Yeah. It was of different so elevations. Cool. It was oh, it so is. Cool. And it's doing such an important thing for the waterway. I'll do an entire oyster podcast at some point because I think it's it's critical, especially for for the East Coast, that more and more of these um, oyster Absolutely. farms go in and and do it in the right way, like Alex is. Um, so excited for all of this. Well, I mean, it, the, you know, the oyster production just in general is a really unique, like you said, you need to do a podcast on that altogether. There's not really a need to go eat a wild oyster. You know, it's not like farm raised catfish versus a regular maybe the catfish folks are upset at me for saying that or farm raised shrimp versus wild there's a big taste difference yep. right well no these oysters are grown in the exact same water right next to the wild quote unquote wild oyster and they're cleaning the water they're cleaning the water well i think it's something like 50 gallons a day per oyster i mean it's some stupid it's number. phenomenal yeah and so i mean gosh i spread the word to anybody to listen that you know, we all we need to make it a law that you can't eat wild oysters. That it needs to be farm raised. Frankly, you know, well, just the more we get of that, the better our waterways are going to be. You know, I think a good start would be just to encourage people to eat more oysters because if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna order the oysters at a restaurant, you're gonna eat those oysters. That means that that's going to increase the demand, and then the supply will come to absolutely and more people will be oyster farming, and our waterways are going to get cleaner. Yeah. That's something all we, those we take, come in and you know, out of the ocean. you've been, been blessed to come down here and kind of be exposed to this area and see how integrated, geographically speaking, the waterways, the estuaries, the agriculture, the trees are. Yep. You know, we take great pride at Tidewater Grain um, with our water. We call it tailwater. Mm -hmm. That before we release our water every year, we are monitoring water quality to Good. ensure yeah. that that we don't have this mess that they've got going on in Mississippi to yep. make sure that we're not turning any water loose that we wouldn't drink. And in fact, I drink water every year just to prove that point. Yeah. Right. That this water has no nitrogen, no heavy metals, no nothing in it, that it is completely clear. See right to the bottom, like the Bahamas, right? Our water that our rice, our rice effectively has become a filter as part of this marsh mm -hmm. estuary area because in our farm, on our farm, the the farm that you went to, is the fresh water and the salt water is separated by an inch and a half piece of lumber. Right. On one side of this piece of wood is salt water. On this side is fresh water because that's what we need to grow the crops in. So if we take any problem that we've got and then push that to the salt water, we're killing our friends, Alex Adams and those guys at Lighthouse Shoal and all that because they live off of water. Yep. You know, they've got to have the water, the water quality for the fish and everything that we do. So all of that has to be integrated together so that we're not helping one group and hurting another to make this thing work. Because it's all connected. It's all connected. It's deeply connected. I never uh, would have expected that I would do a show where we talked about um, thermodynamics in, <laughs> in race cars and... Uh, and hydrodynamics and hydroponics. It's basically and, the same. Yeah. It's basically the same stuff. <laughs> but I've enjoyed this very much. Uh, if people are interested in supporting Tidewater and want to try this rice, how do they find you? Go to the easiest way is to go check us out on the web, www.tidewatergrain.com. Uh, T I D E W A T E R G is in golf. R A I N. You would not believe the amount of people that think that we do a drain business, that we're in plumbing, because of my my draw makes the grain sound like drain. Um, so it is tidewatergrain.com. You can catch more of our story. A lot of our history is there. The history of the rice, and uh, probably does a better job at explaining it than me. It's a little more polished than uh, than I am. Yeah, and if you ever get a chance to eat this stuff, 10 out of 10 would recommend because I like it a lot. That is awesome. Yeah. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your time and for the conversation. Jim, and you're I'm the best. Lo looking forward to eating some food here. Frogmore stew, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Whatever this is. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Thank you. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm going to keep bringing you these stories from normal people just like you who have done extraordinary things. Everyone is an expert at something and they have interesting perspectives on life 
and work and the environment and all of the things that we care about. I'm going to keep bringing that to you. And I want to thank you so much for making this show possible. I also want to thank Emily Bratcher for producing this show. She does a great job editing. Really appreciate her. I want to thank John Chatelain. He did the art for the Six Ranch podcast. And Celia, soon to be Harlander, uh, she digitized that so that we can get it out there on the internet for you. Also want to thank Justin Hay for writing this original music and the beautiful whistling that you're listening to right now. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Please keep listening to the show. Write me a review if you feel like it. And just keep doing your thing and we'll all learn from this together. It's been fun and, you know, we're, we're just getting started.